known for walking around with his trademark prayer beads and a stick, as well as his outrageous claims of how he could cure HIV and AIDS with his herbal concoction. Yaya Jame is a Gambian politician and former military officer who was the second president of Gambia from 1994 to the year 2017. Yaya Jame was only 29 years old when he took control over the tiny West African nation of the Gambia in a military coup against the country's long-term leader, Dauda Jawara. As Gambia's eccentric dictator, Jame was known for expressing bizarre views. For example, he claimed that he could cure infertility among women. To make matters worse, it is believed that he and his cronies swindled the nation off of about $1 billion during his time in power before he lost the presidency to Adama Barrow. In this episode of African Biographics, we look at the life story of Yaya Jame, the eccentric dictator from the Gambia. The Gambia is a small English-speaking West African country with at least 10 different ethnic groups. The country gained its independence from Britain in 1965. After independence, Sir Dauda Jawara was named the Prime Minister. He was then elected as the President of that country in 1970. Jawara would remain the President for nearly 25 years, but allegations of corruption against his regime started to mount. It was said that not even one high school had been built during his rule. The situation in the country reached a boiling point in July of 1994 when a group of young Gambian military officers confronted Jawara to express grievances over unpaid army wages and the rise in corruption. The leader of this group was Yaya Jame, who was then the commander of the nation's military police and the subject of this video. Yaya Jame was born on the 25th of May 1965 in a village called Kanilai, Gambia, three months after the country had gained independence from the British. Yaya Jame joined the Gambian National Army in 1984 and was commissioned a second lieutenant in 1989. In August of 1992, he became the commanding officer of the military police of the Yundum Barracks in Gambia. He went on to receive extensive military training from neighboring Senegal and military police training in Alabama in the United States of America. As I mentioned before, Yaya Jame's rise to power began in July of 1994 when he and a group of young officers in the Gambian National Army seized power from President Sedauda Jawara in a military coup. After the system, a just system and to put up structures that will ensure that what happened in the past 10, uh, 30 years would never happen again. And as to when we'll hand over it, it depends on how soon we are able to put those structures in place. And as soon as those structures are in, in place, we return back to Africa. After this whole fiasco, Dauda Jawara fled to a United States warship that was docked in Banju and the transfer of power to Yaya Jamir's group occurred without bloodshed. Jamir's group identified itself as the Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council, with Jamir acting as the chairman. Soon after seizing power, this council that was led by Jamir suspended the constitution, sealed the borders of the country, and implemented a nationwide curfew. Following the coup, Yaya Jame promised that this coup was a coup with a difference. He pledged an early return to civilian rule and a commitment to follow through on projects to alleviate some of Gambia's most pressing material needs. That year, after taking power in 1994, Jame founded the Alliance for Patriotic Reorientation and Construction as his political party. During the latter half of the 1990s, the Gambian leadership took steps to establish its legitimacy in the eyes of the international community. Presidential elections were held in 1996 and Yaya Jame rapidly promoted himself through the ranks of the armed forces. He then retired from the army so that he could claim that he was running for the presidency as a civilian candidate. A new constitution was drafted and put in place in time for the election. After the election of 1996, 
Yahya Jameh was narrowly elected president in a national election which observers declared was neither free nor fair. However, Yahya Jameh began to deliver on some of his early promises to transform the country. Jameh broke ground on a new hospital, the first since independence, and a new international airport. A new national television station began broadcasting. He also set in motion other telecommunications improvements and repaired many of the Gambia's roads. 16 new schools were built in 26 months. Yahya Jameh's government also cultivated relations with Libya, Cuba and Iran, countries that were viewed as outcasts of the international community. Libya was reportedly supplying Yahya Jameh's regime with military aid. There were also unconfirmed reports that the Jameh regime was involved in drug trafficking. On the 21st of March 2006, there was a coup attempt against Yahya Jameh that was quickly crushed. While Yahya Jameh was visiting Mauritania, the army chief of staff, Colonel Ndure Cham, attempted to seize power. When this particular coup attempt failed, the colonel fled to Senegal along with other alleged conspirators most of whom were arrested, returned to Gambia, and put on trial for treason. After the botched coup attempt of 2006, Yahya Jameh became even more resolute in his oppressive strategies against the Gambian population. People were jailed without trial, there were allegations of extrajudicial killings, and journalists disappeared without traces. As I mentioned, Yahya Jameh's rule became increasingly authoritative, and by 1998, the corruption that he had placed to eliminate was now becoming evident in his own administration. He and his cronies started to loot the state resources, and some of the looting was laid bare by the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, the OCCRP. This organization had reviewed thousands of leaked documents that detailed how Yahya Jameh's government looted the nation's funds over 22 years. Yahya Jameh hijacked government funds and departments, set up private accounts at the central bank, and built a patronage network while ruling the country through fear and violence. In total, it is said that Yahya Jameh and his associates looted or misappropriated at least $975 million. And according to the report, the money was obtained from the following entities. Approximately $360 million was obtained from the state-run telecoms company. A further $325 million was obtained via illicit timber revenue. And Yaya Jameh's cronies looted $55 million from the state-run oil company. The dictator Yahya Jameh frequently drove his black hammer from his official residence in Banju, the capital, to a lavish private estate that he built for himself in his home village of Kanilai. Jameh spent some of the stolen money on his palace in Kanilai, where he had his own private mosque, built a jungle warfare training camp, and kept camels, hyenas, zebras, and other exotic animals. The looted funds also supported a lavish lifestyle that Yahya Jameh's average official monthly government salary of about $6,000 could never sustain. The dictator also spent his money in other ways that were meant to show him to be a benevolent and generous ruler, but not typically in ways that benefited ordinary Gambians. For example, in 2010, using diverted money, Yaya Jameh held a tribute concert for Michael Jackson after the pop superstar's death. He also hosted a Miss Black USA beauty pageant in the Gambia using about $1 million that was illicitly diverted from the Port Authority. As you have probably imagined by now, Jameh didn't achieve this state of kleptocracy on his own. He had a close network of advisors and enforcers that he posted to key positions and shuffled around at will. He often used these people as signatories to bank accounts and loan agreements and these people played a key role in his money transfer schemes. Yaya Jameh's right-hand man, General Suleiman Baji, was identified as his main enforcer both on the political landscape as well as in the business arena. The general provided protection for Jameh's timber smuggling operation. 
The Secretary General of the Office of the President, Nua Toure, was a crucial intermediary between Jamia's office and various government departments. According to the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, they discovered documents that included directives which Toure had signed. These directives authorized the seizure of bank accounts and the sacking of public officials who questioned orders from Yaya Jamei. Jamei's favored officials shared in his prosperity, but they were also vulnerable to his mood swings and his affinity for violence and punishment. Many of his officials who fell out of favor found themselves incarcerated along journalists, political activists, and human rights campaigners. All of these antics by Yaya Jame and company did little to help address the needs of the Gambia, which is a poor country with poor healthcare as well as few basic services. According to the World Bank, the country's external debt at the end of the year 2017 was around $490 million, which is less the amount that Yaya Jame allegedly stole. One of the strangest ideas that Yaya Jame conceived was his program where his regime forced thousands of people with HIV to undergo treatment with the concoction of herbs he had invented himself. In January of 2007, he announced that he had received a mandate from God to create an HIV and AIDS herbal cure from seven herbs found in the Quran. Jamea claimed that his cure could eradicate HIV from the body in just three days. If I fail, I would have failed them, I would have disappointed them. And the consequences would be very drastic for me as a person. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not fun. Coming out and treating these people is not fun. Somebody lying down there, knowing that maybe the guy has a few months to live, there are people who come in very bad condition. And lying down there, knowing that they have all their, only, they only have their hope in me. It's a big body, morally, spiritually, and psychologically. So it's not something that one, anyone would do just for fun or just for mischief. I'm not a president that makes mis mischief in the world. So given his invention, Jame created the Presidential Alternative Treatment Program to distribute his fraudulent HIV cure. The program operated from 2007 until 2016 when Jamea was voted out of power. He refused to have his cure subjected to scientific testing for efficacy and safety. Instead, he sent the blood samples of his first nine patients to a laboratory in Senegal to prove that his cure worked. Although the results showed only the CD4 counts of the patients, Jame argued that the levels of the CD4 count were proof of efficacy. However, officials at the Senegalese University who had conducted the testing refuted Jame's claim, explaining that no conclusion of the effectiveness of his herbal cure had been made. They remarked, and I quote, It's dishonest of the Gambian government to use our results in this way. When Jamir first announced this concoction, it was to cure HIV and AIDS, but he later went on to claim that it could cure diabetes, infertility and cancer, among other diseases. So the first group of patients that had to undergo his treatment program was a mixture of people who had chosen to enter the program and people who had joined the program under duress. The patients were grouped according to their date of arrival and were given strict instructions for their participation including discontinuation of the antiretroviral medication and abstinence from sex, caffeine, alcohol, and cola nuts. The patients in this program were also forbidden from eating or drinking anything from outside the facilities or receiving visitors. To make matters worse, in violation of privacy rights and patient confidentiality, the names, faces, CD4 counts, and viral loads of the patients were published on an official website promoting and providing information about the program. The true impact of this program on the lives of the people living with HIV and AIDS has not been assessed since the program was disbanded. So as we all know, everything comes to an end, and for Yaya Jame. This happened in the presidential elections of December 2016. 
In the Gambia, the months leading up to the December 2016 elections were tense. Two members of the opposition died while in custody of Gambian security forces and at least 30 more were arrested and given prison sentences. Various international groups and other bodies had sent a warning that these presidential elections would neither be free nor fair. However, something had changed in the political landscape of the country. For the first time, several opposition groups rallied to support just one candidate, Adama Baro, as they were determined to topple Yaya Jameh. This newly united opposition front posed the greatest threat to Yaya Jameh in his 22 years of rule. As we have come to get used to in several African countries, prior to the elections, the internet was cut off and international calls were blocked, adding to the already tense political climate. In a surprising turn of events, for Yaya Jameh at least, Adama Barrow was declared the winner of the December elections, taking about 46% of the vote, and Yaya Jameh came in second with about 37%. What really surprised people was that after these results were announced, Yaya Jameh made a gracious concession to Adama Baro. In his concession, he vowed not to contest the results and pledged to assist Adama Baro with the transition. But well, it was too good to be true. Yaya Jameh's acceptance of the election results did not last very long. Less than a week after the results were released, the Electoral Commission revised the results because of a tabulation error that had been found and corrected. Adama Barrow still had the most votes, but his margin of victory was reduced to winning just 43% of the vote to Yaya Jameh's 39%. Yaya Jameh then rejected the results and called for a new election. What was to follow in the Gambia was a month-long standoff with Yaya Jameh determined to hold on to power. It was only after pressure from other West African heads of state that Jameh eventually conceded and left the country for exile. He was accompanied by a cargo plane stuffed with luxuries, including at least three luxury vehicles. And that was it. Or is it? So it turns out that Yaya Jameh still has a role to play in the politics of the Gambia. Recently, it has been announced that the Gambian president, Adama Barrow, and Yaya Jameh are joining forces ahead of the upcoming presidential elections in the Gambia that will be held on the 4th of December 2021. It has been said that Barrow's National People's Party and Yaya Jameh's Alliance for the Patriotic Reorientation and Construction Party will work together to achieve their goals at the upcoming presidential elections. Let me know in the comment section below what your thoughts are on this proposed alliance and your overall thoughts on the Yaya Jameh story. Don't forget to like and share the video if you enjoyed it. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been Tatenda for African Biographics. Until next time, cheers. Have a good one.